This is Seymour Rocks reporting from Down Under. Uh, I'm doing more on uh, ozone. I made a video just uh, a few days ago, uh, and it's to respond partially in response to this, that because um, I was citing uh, data from Copernicus, um, and this is what they've come up. With today, um, Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service forecasts a rapid decrease in the size of the ozone hole over the next five days. It could be thin enough to close, which has never happened this early in the year. Watch this space for updates as we track uh, this unprecedented event. Well, I don't think that things are quite as straightforward as that. Um, I mean, I don't have the advantage of all the uh, of all the data. Uh, I haven't really been tracking this, but I've been following Margot, who's been doing it for about um, uh, twelve to sixteen months now. And uh, some of what they're saying, the actual conclusions, which are kind of put forward almost as a sort of a mantra, don't seem to always be backed up by what we see uh, in the data. So I'm just going to have a look at their latest article uh, which came out yesterday and then I'm going to hark back to some of the data um, that Margot produced on ozone, excellent material, um, as well as just look at a few other uh, miscellaneous aspects to this. I wish to uh, start with this article which came out from CAMS, that's the Copernicus people, and it's entitled uh, CAMS Monitors, a very unusual 2019 ozone hole, and it came out yesterday. Um, less than one month into the 2019 Antarctic ozone hole season, the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service has observed that this year's hole is currently decreasing in size and will rapidly continue to do so over the next three days to reach an unprecedentedly small area for this time of year. The forecast also indicates that after this minimum, the hole will slowly increase in size again. Uh, the current expectation is that the 2019 ozone hole could have the smallest area of any Arctic ozone hole since the mid 80s. It seems to, to me to have just uh, shifted rather than uh, decreased in size. I mean, unless uh, this here is, is, is not Antarctica. Uh, yeah, <laughs> sounds a bit disingenuous to me, I'm not sure. Anyway, I'll go on. Typically the Antarctic o ozone hole starts forming every year in August, reaches a maximum size in October and closes by December. Since early de September, however, the po polar vo vortex, a swirl of cold air in the stratosphere that provides the conditions required for severe stratospheric ozone destruction, and the resulting formation of the Antarctic ozone hole has been displaced off-center and weakened by a sudden warming of the stratosphere. The temperatures in the uh, upper stratosphere rising considerably up to more than 40 degrees above normal. The polar vortex has been more unstable than usual. Uh, it doesn't give the temperatures, but of course uh, <laughs> Uh, sorry, the um, the levels, but these are still extremely low levels of um, of ozone, which uh, rival those uh, when the ozone layer ozone hole was at its peak. So I don't really understand. Uh, it says normally when the sunlight returns to the polar region after 
the Antarctic winter, chemicals formed in the vortex during the polar night initiate rapid destruction of ozone. This year, cold air with low ozone levels has been mixing with warmer, more ozone-rich air from outside the vortex, which is likely diluting and deactivating a fraction of the ozone-depleting chemicals inside the vortex. Uh, this uh, results in less potential for the fast ozone destruction when the springtime sun arrives over Antarctica. I can't really argue um, with their explanations because I'm not really equipped to. All I can do is I can comment on what I actually uh, uh, see. And this, this is what they put out uh, to show that the um, ozone hole uh, is much uh, smaller than normal. Uh, and from what I can see, uh, just from looking at the data, what I see on their website, this rivals um, information that the uh, that the Arctic sea ice all of a sudden has, has become nothing, gone from record levels to uh, nothing special, nothing to pay attention to, uh, really on arrival. I just, I, I, I'm just not sure um, yeah, just not sure really um, it doesn't compute. So I'll just read the last little bit. Cam's senior scientist, Antje Ines, explains, we see a lot of variability in the ozone hole from year to year. Yeah, that's right. I saw considerable variety during the 90s and the early 2000s when I looked at this. For example, in 2007, it was 17, it was quite small, and then in 2018, it was deeper and longer lived. However, this year's activity is extremely unusual. Last time... Something so abnormal was seen was in 2002 when the ozone hole actually broke into two very distinct parts. The Montreal Protocol was signed in 1987 to ban the use of the main uh, human-made ozone-depleting chemicals. Consequently, concentrations of these substances are declining uh, and we expect Antarctic ozone levels to return to pre-1980 uh, values by 2060. This long-term expectation has not changed by this year's very unusual situation. So that's the uh, that's the uh, uh, the narrative. Um, and this, I mean, this is what they all kind of keep repeating. Um, like a mantra, but really, uh, is this uh, backed up uh, by the data? So I'm just going to go over a few things, um, including some uh, monitoring that uh, Marco did last year, and we'll take it from there. Okay, here's the South Pole. And they're in winter time, so this is where the ozone hole or the thinning it's supposed to be the thinnest part in the winter time down there, which is summer here, is supposed to be down here over the South Pole. But what I found is quite disturbing in that the thinnest part is not over the South Pole now, but it's uh, around the middle of the Earth. And while that's loading, I'll show you. See that blue? That's 225 DU. And that's very low. That's very low. And it's very thin. And, and, and then even going up into the 250, 275 range, that's still very thin. And it still lets through lots and lots of ultraviolet radiation. And that's what's causing so many skin cancers and skin problems. And your DNA is unwinding. And I mean, it's a whole laundry list. 
So this is serious stuff. So um, we can see how it, it does move around. It's not constant. It doesn't stay in one place. It does move around. But um, there are patches where it's thicker than other places. Because you can see, like in the orange and red, it's quite a lot thicker. Which, I'm frankly, I'm surprised at with it being winter down there. I thought that it would be not as thick all the way around here, too. But... Because that red is like 425 DU. So there's your south pole, just in case you wanted to know how the ozone hole is going. So let's load this data for <clears throat> the worldwide. And this is total column. This is good ozone that's blocking out the ultraviolet radiation from the sun and cosmic rays and x-rays and things like that and you can see um, on the South Pacific it's not looking good and there's this constant thin point over Ecuador and um, the over the whole middle part of the United States where the equator runs is absolutely the thinnest and then it's thin up here. And these are the levels of ozone uh, globally. This is total column. And you can see the high areas here in the Antarctic. Um, and but what uh, is really noticeable is this uh, fall away of ozone low levels uh, right across the equator and some quite low levels elsewhere in the equatorial uh, region. And I'm kind of interested in this in the context of what uh, uh, Dane Wigington of the uh, Geoengineering Watch .org is uh, is saying. So this is from uh, Think Progress, the most conservative kind of climate change thing uh, on the web. Uh, science ge geoengineering scheme damages the ozone layer. Science has published a major new study, the sensitivity of polar ozone depletion to proposed geoengineering schemes. That study finds the large burden of sulfate aerosols injected into the stratosphere by the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991, called Earth, and enhanced the destruction of polar ozone in the subsequent few years. The continuous injection of sulfur into the stratosphere has been suggested as a geoengineering scheme to counteract global warming. We use an empirical relationship between ozone depletion and chlorine activation to estimate how this approach might influence polar ozone an injection of sulfur, sulfur large enough to compensate for surface warming caused by the doubling of atmospheric CO2 would strongly increase the extent of Arctic ozone depletion during the present century for cold winters and would cause a considerable delay between 30 and 70 years in the expected recovery of the Antarctic ice, uh, ozone hole. And then this is from the Guardian um, admission. Ozone layer is not recovering over populated areas, scientists warn. While the hole over Antarctica has been closing, the protective ozone is thinning at lower latitudes where the sunlight is stronger and billions of people live. The ozone layer that protects people from the sun's ultraviolet radiation is not recovering over most uh, highly populated regions, scientists warned on Tuesday. And I've never seen 
a single article uh, in the media that makes a distinction between the different uh, um, wavelengths. Of, uh, I mean, there are three different types of ultraviolet light, and they're quite different. Ultraviolet A, B, and C. And uh, B and C are not supposed to, um, you know, to be part of this equation. The greatest losses in ozone occurred over Antarctica, but the whole year has been closing. See again the mantra, since the chemicals causing the problems were banned by the Montreal Pro Protocol, uh, but the ozone layer wraps the entire Earth and new research has revealed that it is thinning in the lower atmosphere over the non-polar areas. Well, there's a lot of uh, stuff come out to uh, confirm that they've actually um, uh, found large quantities of CFCs being produced in China. So, uh, you know, we're told that it's all behind us, but I don't quite believe it. And then there's this unprecedented ozone hole opens over Canadian Arctic. A massive Arctic ozone hole opened up over the Northern Hemisphere for the first time this year. So I haven't got a date for this. Some of these articles are getting a bit old, but um, uh, an international research team reported Sunday. And then uh, from geoengineeringwatch.org, uh, Dane Wickington, record shattering UV radiation levels finally confirmed. And what he's doing is he's referring uh, to this article here. Um, from 2014, record levels of solar ultraviolet measured in South America. A team of researchers in the US and Germany has measured the highest level of ultraviolet radiation ever recorded on the Earth's surface. The extraordinary UV fluxes observed in the Bolivian Andes, only 1500 miles from the equator, are far above those normally considered to be harmful to both terrestrial and aquatic life. The results are being published in the open access journal Frontiers in Environmental Science. These record setting levels were not measured in Antarctica where ozone holes have been a recurring problem for decades, said team leader Natalie A. Cabriol of the SETI Institute and NASA Ames Research Center. This is in the tropics in an area where there are small towns and villages. Some of these articles are getting a bit old, but um, uh, an international research team reported Sunday. And then uh, from geoengineeringwatch.org, uh, Dane Wickington, record shattering UV radiation levels finally confirmed and what he's doing is he's referring uh, to this article here um, from 2014 record levels of solar ultraviolet measured in South America. A team of researchers in the US and Germany has measured the highest level of ultraviolet radiation ever recorded on the Earth's surface. The extraordinary UV fluxes observed in the Bolivian Andes, only 1500 miles from the equator, are far above those normally considered to be harmful to both terrestrial and aquatic life. The results are being published in the open access journal Frontiers in Environmental Science. These record setting levels were not measured in Antarctica where ozone holes have been a recurring problem for decades, said team leader Natalie A. Cabriol of the SETI Institute and NASA Ames Research Center. This is in the tropics in an area where there are small towns and villages. Oh, this is interesting. This is from a very sort of conventional uh, uh, lecture by a Professor David Caroli who says some things that I immediately can uh, 
C are not exactly straightforward. Uh, he says that the ozone layer is 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 healing, which is the conventional uh, viewpoint. Um, he says that the Montreal Protocol has been hugely successful in uh, in controlling um, CFCs, which are also uh, uh, greenhouse gases, and he ignores the huge uh, levels of CFCs that are coming from non-conventional sources and, for, and, and from and from China. So since he made this um, this talk, this lecture in December 2015, there's a lot of things that have been um, proven just to be not true. But what I'm really interested in is his ideas on uh, geoengineering. Fertilization likely has adverse impacts on ecosystems. But the really interesting one is solar radiation management. You can do it. Sorry. Other people can do it relatively inexpensively. You only need big second-hand aeroplanes, and they exist. There's a lot of second-hand 747s that you can rent. You can inject the aerosols into the lower part of the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere. And what does it do? Well, first thing is, if you stop, because you've got all the carbon dioxide, it warms rapidly. It reduces rainfall in the tropics in exactly the same way as volcanoes do. That leads to permanent drought, reduced rainfall in the tropics. Not a good solution if you live in the tropics. It changes the way that the distribution of rain and sunlight reaches the earth. But the critical factor is increasing the amount of particles in the stratosphere causes increased ozone depletion because it creates over the whole of the atmosphere exactly the characteristics of the ozone hole over Antarctica, which is primarily caused because of ozone depleting chemicals having a catalytic reaction on the surface of particles. It will lead to significant global ozone depletion and it will kill people from extra skin cancer. You don't hear it talked about, but it's not clear that a solution that kills people while allowing more fossil fuels to be dug up and burnt is a good solution. Not in my view. But of course, it looks pretty in cartoons. There are many different adverse impacts from solar radiation management. It changes rainfall patterns. It leads to reduced rainfall in the tropics. It increases health impacts and skin cancer. 